Hello and welcome. My name is Sean Allison. I am the CEO of Cashflow Options. We are bringing you a very exciting guest here today. Uh, and my goodness me, I'm just looking at the chat here. People from all over the world. Uh, my goodness me, Canada, New York City, Vancouver, uh, Mexico, many people. Uh, of our, my members are from around Australia and New Zealand and the UK. Uh, Orlando, fantastic Z. Uh, Dr. Keller, you're from Seattle. Wow, huge amount of people here and why not? Uh, we have a world leading expert and someone who you want to listen to. I live by two rules. These two rules are this. Number one, look at people's actions don't just listen to what they say, right? Their actions speak much louder than the words. The other thing is people lie, numbers don't. So we wanna be able to actually look at the numbers here and really understand what is going on. And uh, Jim Rickards is the GOAT. Yes, I would agree with that as well. And uh, you know, the next guest that we have on is someone who really understands what's going on with people's actions and understands the actions. And more important than that, he has results. A lot of people are very good at talking, but when it comes to results is where they fall down. And uh, our next guest, Jim Rickards, is someone who has incredible amount of results. And we really wanna to listen to what he has to say, particularly in 2021. Now, myself, I'm a professional trader. I've been trading now for 20 years. Last year in 2020, we understand it was a very turbulent time for many, many people. The stock market dropped 35%, one of the fastest falls in history. And then we saw an historic rally to all time highs, which is where we find ourselves right now. So we want to understand what is going on. Okay, what is going on right now? We understand what's going on as far as uh, the pandemic and uh, shutdowns and things like that. But you know, what impact is that going to have on your wealth? Where do you invest now? We we want to talk about precious metals, no doubt about that, gold in particular, and certainly silver. And the next expert, Jim uh, Rickards, is someone who is an absolute uh, gun at that particular area. Precious metals is where he lives. And, uh, you know, you really couldn't get anyone better to explain to you what's happening, because you need to understand what's happening first. What are people's actions? What are the numbers telling us? And then where are we likely to make money and protect ourselves going forward? So Jim Rickards, my goodness me, he is an American lawyer, economist, investment banker. Uh, he's a speaker, media commentator in all matters around finance and precious metals. He is the author of Currency Wars, the making of the next global financial crisis and six other books. Pretty impressive. I didn't understand uh, or I didn't realize that uh, Jim has a master of laws in taxation, which I didn't realize, from the New York University School of Law. Now, he held senior positions at Citibank, Long Term Capital, and Caxon Associates. Now, he was the general counsel for the hedge fund long term capital management, and he successfully, have a listen to this, negotiated 3.6 billion US dollar rescue of the firm via the US Federal Reserve in 1988. He worked on Wall Street for 35 years, and uh, he is someone that we really want to listen to. Uh, you know, I mean, even the Pentagon gets advice from Jim, and uh, I certainly respect you a lot, Jim, and I really appreciate you being here today and giving us your time. First thing I would probably want to ask you, and I know you're going to lead into a presentation now, but what do you feel about what the overall, I suppose, how do you feel the governments around the world have responded to this pandemic? In a lot of ways, I feel like some of my freedoms have been taken away and it's sort of, I don't know whether this is going to be something that's ongoing. Uh, have they handled this crisis well, these lockdowns well? And, you know, what is going on? Where are we likely to head with the markets at all time highs, the uh, the NASDAQ has been selling off recently, but we saw a 4% move up last night. So, you know, we're seeing extreme volatility, which is great for me as a short term momentum trader. But for people with longer term investments, they want to sort of get an idea of where we're likely to head. So I suppose I'd love you to start off with, have the governments handled this well, as far as the the actual shutdowns and managing this pandemic? And then, you know, how can we protect our wealth and where are we likely to go from here in 2021? Jim, thank you so much for being here. Uh, thank you, Sean. Th first of all, thank you for that introduction. It's very kind. And uh, like you, I was 
watching the chat room a little bit before we came on. And I know you have a, a deep uh, following in Australia, New Zealand, uh, but uh, I was just blown away at how we have a really global audience tonight. As they go sing Oman and Paris and Montreal. And uh, one of the participants said, uh, Seacoast NH, and for those who don't know, NH stands for New Hampshire. And that's where I live. I'm on the seacoast of uh, New Hampshire. So one of my neighbors, I could probably uh, wave to him from the window or whatever. But uh, yeah, it's great. It's very, very impressive audience. And thank you again for the introduction. Um, I do have a, a, a little more formal presentation, but just to answer your question. In the early stages of the pandemic, going back uh, last um, February, March, when it really started to spread around the world, I'm inclined to be a little uh, sympathetic to the role of the government in the sense that no one knew what was going on. No one understood the disease. No one, there was no uh, vaccine at the time. We'll talk a little bit more about, about vaccines. Uh, it was a new virus. It, it, um, it had never, this particular virus had never made it to humans before. So I think one can be um, uh, a little forgiving in the sense they made a lot of mistakes, but they were doing the best they can, uh, best they could. But as the pandemic wore on, and as the mistakes were pointed out, and as more was learned, I saw governments persist in very um, destructive policies. So, uh, so at the end of the day, I think they, they bungled it, they did more harm than good, uh, and they missed a lot of opportunities to uh, fight the disease at the same time, support the economy uh, better than they did. So uh, and, and the initial response, again, a lot of mistakes, but uh, I, think, I think we need to be, uh, uh, say a little forgiving about that, but but as as it went on, uh, you know, one of our um, U.S. political figures, a fellow named Rahm Emanuel, who was um, chief of staff to President Obama, and I'm going all the way back to 2009, later the mayor of Chicago. I uh, remember when Obama came in, we were in in the in the global financial crisis, um, and he was famous for saying, "Never let a good crisis go to waste." Uh, he wasn't the first one to say it, but he he reiterated that, and I think we've seen that. Uh, uh, this time in a very negative way, which is uh, politicians of all stripes, you know, progressives, conservatives, liberals, as the case may be, uh, they always have an agenda, uh, things on the shelf, as I say, policies that they want to put in place. But they're either unpopular or not feasible or can't be financed. And so they just sit there. But once it, when a crisis comes along, if you can instill enough fear and get enough of a, a herd mentality, if you will, they pull these things off the off the shelf and they go ahead and implement them under the guise of fear or panic or we have to do something. And then it, maybe a year goes by or two years go by and you look back and say, wow, where did that come from? How did we ever you know, give up that much freedom, uh, create a surveillance state? Um, the vaccine is, uh, um, it's not a real vaccine. It's not a, a traditional vaccine. It's actually genetic modification therapy, not well understood. That's not a conspiracy theory. You can, I've read the pharmaceutical company uh, papers describing their um, the formation, the creation and the testing of the vaccine. And that, that's what they say, this is experimental. So uh, a lot has um, been pushed through under the guise of COVID relief that is really a uh, political agenda. We're going to be stuck with it for a long time. So I think on the whole, uh, they did a very poor job. A lot of people died unnecessarily. Um, but uh, but here we are. And then the question for investors, of course, is what's the best, um, best path forward? Yeah, absolutely. Now, for me personally, uh, you know, 2020 was a record year just simply because of the volatility and being able to make money from that. Uh, you know, 2021 has already proven itself to be quite volatile as well. But for me, going forward, uh, you know, gold. Now, I know gold is certainly an area of expertise for yourself. A lot of people look at gold as a a hedge against inflation. It's more of a hedge against negative real yields, right? Um, it's both. Uh, and, and you're right. There, there are a number of drivers of the gold price uh, and uh, interest rates are one of them. But when we say interest rates, Sean, you've made a very important point, which is people don't think carefully about the difference between the nominal rate and the real rate. Uh, the nominal rate is the rate you, you see on a trading screen. They'll talk about it on financial TV. Uh, you know, the U.S., U.S. Treasury 10-year note yield to maturity right now is about just under 1.6 percent. That's the nominal rate. But you have to take the nominal rate, subtract inflation to get to the real rate. And people say, you know, interest rates are at all time lows. Well, nominal rates are close to real time lows. That's true. But real rates are not. In 1980, 
I borrowed money. It was actually my first mortgage. I borrowed money at 13%. And I told my mother, she, she cried because her first mortgage was like 2%, you know, back in the 1950s. Uh, but I said, mom, I said, I'm borrowing money at 13%. But at the time, inflation was 15%. So my real rate was negative two. And since I was paying, since I was paying interest, uh, mortgage interest at the time was tax deductible. And I lived in New York City, so taxes were 50%, five zero. So um, after inflation, after taxes, my after inflation, after tax cost of borrowing was negative eight, negative 8%. And in fact, I was making 8% by being a borrower. So that's, that's a, a low uh, real rate. That's the real rate. Nominal rate was near an all-time high, but the real rate after taxes was negative eight. That's, but that's the kind of rate you have to do to get people to go out and borrow money and invest and get the economy moving again. Right now, again, I'll use the US as a frame of reference, but a lot of the world is very similarly situated. Our nominal rate is 1.6%, but our inflation is about 1.6%. So the, so the real rate is zero, but zero is not negative. Again, I had negative eight, today you've got zero. So that's a, we have a much higher real rate than we did uh, at a time of very high inflation. So you've got to make that distinction. You've got to take out inflation to get to the real rate. And obviously real, real rates have got to be negative two or 3% to get the kind of stimulus that people keep talking about. You know, you, you'll see the, the Federal Reserve is you know, printing trillions of dollars, which is true. And the US Congress is doing multi-trillion dollar deficit spending bills, which is true. But neither one of them will work because um, the money that the, the Fed is printing is going to the banks to buy bonds, but the banks are giving it back to the Fed in the form of excess reserves. So it's just sitting there. The Fed prints it as a liability and then it comes back um, as an asset in the form of the bonds, and then it comes back again in the form of excess reserves. So the money's not getting out into the economy. It's not being let and spent, which is what you really have to do to get the economy moving again. As far as deficit spending is concerned, uh, and again, I, I have charts on all this, which I'll, I'll take the audience through. Um, there, there is something called the, the Keynesian multiplier. So the idea is you borrow a dollar, you're a government, you borrow a dollar, you spend a dollar, and you get more than a dollar of GDP. Maybe you get a dollar twenty or a dollar thirty of GDP, and the evidence supports that. But Keynes called it his general theory, but it's actually a special theory. I mean, what I just described works in certain circumstances. So if you're just coming out of a recession or you're in one, uh, and you have a low debt ratio and you have a lot of unused capacity, then yes, uh, if, if people want to spend, the government can spend, and you can get something out of that. But there comes a time. Uh, and the, the ratio has been identified at 90%. When your debt level is 90% or more of your gross domestic product, the multiplier goes below one. So now you borrow a dollar and you spend a dollar, but you only get 90 cents of GDP or 80 cents of GDP. You don't even get your dollar back. Um, so, so you're not getting that pop. You're not getting that extra something. Um, and what you're doing is digging a deeper hole for yourself because in the example I just gave, uh, you borrow a dollar, so the debt goes up by a dollar, but your GDP goes up by less than a dollar. So if you increase the um, uh, numer numerator by a large amount and you increase the denominator or the fraction, you're making the fraction worse. The debt to GDP ratio is actually getting worse, getting larger, in other words. So we're past the point where debt, uh, additional government debt, um, can create uh, GDP or create wealth that actually is a headwind to growth because people look at this and say, well, you know, I, I don't have a PhD in economics, but this is going to end badly one way or another. They're either going to have inflation, um, in which case that's just a, a hidden tax, or they're going to raise taxes to pay off the debt. So people actually save more and spend less, which is the opposite of what the policymakers want. But that's that's a natural human reaction to what they're saying. So um, monetary policy doesn't work because um, you don't have the velocity of a turnover. Fiscal policy doesn't work because the debt is the ratio is too high already. So, so can the Fed print money? Yes. Can the government spend money that they, they don't have? Yes. But it doesn't stimulate. I, I keep telling people, you can call it money printing or you can call it spending, but don't call it stimulus because it doesn't stimulate anything. Yes, very, very good point. The uh, the velocity of money and certainly record savings uh, right now. People are saving more than ever. The other thing about gold, uh, just talking a little bit more about gold, just simply because my members sort of ask asking me always about gold and it's not my area of expertise, right? So I really want to ask someone whose area it is. Now, 
We've seen gold move down since the August highs. Uh, could you give us the reason for that? Is it because the US Treasury yields are going up? Um, is it Bitcoin? Is it the expectation of inflation? What What is the reason for gold moving down uh, at the moment? Well, I would say um, in your analysis, two out of three ain't bad. Uh, nothing to do with Bitcoin. But the other two points you raised are, are really powerful. Uh, interest rates um, uh, going up uh, and, uh, you know, as I say, the dollar uh, getting stronger as well. Um, so if, if you like, I actually have a uh, I'd love to talk about gold. It's one of my favorite subjects. If you like, I can jump ahead to some slides and uh, maybe that'll sure. just kind of illustrate illustrate the points I'm about to make. So let me, uh, um, let me, uh, so this is just the intro slide. So uh, uh, again, great to be with everybody. And here's a slide, I'm not gonna spend any time on it. This is my bio if anyone's interested um, and a synopsis of my new book, The New Great Depression, Winners and Losers in a Post-Pandemic World. I believe the slides have been handed out to most of the audience, or at least uh, uh, you can get them from, uh, from Sean and his team. So don't need to spend a lot of time there. But what I'm gonna do is jump ahead and forgive me for racing through this. We'll come back to some of it, but um, right. I want to, I want to kind of talk about uh, what's driving gold right now. Now, now this chart is um, uh, basically the, this is the dollar price of gold. It's, it's fairly straightforward from 2017 uh, till today. And you can see that the trend is up. Um, gold uh, actually bottomed uh, at $1,050 an ounce on December 16, 2015. Um, even today at $1,700 an ounce, give or take, this is US dollars, um, that's a 70% gain. So we've had a significant gains since the start of this new bull market. And I'll talk a little bit about the bull market. But as you can see, since, um, uh, since August, uh, it's been a downtrend. It's come down very sharply, um, literally just in the last uh, week or so, last five or six trading days. Well, the reason for that is very simple, which is that 10-year uh, interest rates on 10-year treasury notes are soaring. Uh, between September and today, they've gone from, uh, that yield of maturity has gone from about 90 basis points to, uh, it peaked at 1.6% uh, um, or 160 basis points, um, or sorry, uh, uh, that, that's right, 160 basis points, or 1.6%. Uh, it's backed off a little bit the last couple of days, but still up around that level. So it, the, the correlation is very stark as the uh, as interest rates go up and as the dollar gets stronger, the dollar price of gold comes down. Well, that makes sense. Uh, in other words, uh, you know, people say, you know, is the dollar stronger, is the dollar weaker, et cetera. And my answer is compared to what? And if you're talking about being stronger or weaker, you need a metric, you need a, a measuring stick and, you know, a yardstick or, or some uh, you know, meter or some some standard unit of measurement. And people tend to use, there are some dollar indices out there. There's the Bloomberg dollar index. Uh, the Federal Reserve has a uh, trade weighted uh, broad dollar index uh, that, that I look at and find very useful. Uh, there's the DXY, Dixie, that's a futures contract. Um, but all of them are basket of the dollar compared to a basket of currencies. The baskets vary. But uh, the primary uh, component is the euro. Um, the dollar makes up about 60% of global reserves. The euro makes up a little under 30% of global reserves. So you take the dollar and the euro together, they're about 90% of global reserves and, and global payments. So the, the euro US dollar cross rate is, uh, is, is the largest component of all the indices and it's the most important single cross rate in the world. But here's the problem. All currencies are in the same boat. I call them passengers in the same lifeboat. Some of them may be taller or shorter or smarter or better looking or not, but they're all in the same lifeboat. They're all they're all going to sort of sink or uh, survive together. Uh, and currencies trade in a range. You know, the the euro has been as, as low as eighty cents, and now I'm going back twenty years. Uh, the low was around eighty cents. The high was around a dollar sixty. That's a fairly broad range. But in the last 10 years, that range has narrowed considerably. It runs between about $1.05 and $1.40. And in the last six months, there's been very little vol volatility. It's kind of centered around $1.20. And that's the point. Major currencies, talking major reserve currencies, not Zimbabwe, they don't go to zero, like uh, Hertz stock or a company that's in bankruptcy. They don't go to zero. And they don't go to the moon uh, the way Apple does. They trade in a range, and uh, the way you make money in, in currency trading actually is to understand that and look for those 
pivot points. So for those high and low points in the range when it's going to turn around. But they don't really tell you much about each other. I remember in 2010 to 2015, during the Euro sovereign debt crisis, everyone, you know, you had Nouriel Rabini and Paul Krugman and Joe Stiglitz running around with the hair on fire saying, you know, the euro is going to collapse and Greece is going to be kicked out and Spain is going to quit and go back to the peseta and lower the unit labor costs and northern tier and southern tier and all that. And I said, nonsense. None of that's going to happen. Nobody's getting kicked out. Nobody's leaving. Um, they'll add members. In fact, they have since I said that when they had 16 members today, they have 19 and, and more on the waiting list. Um, but the point is, uh, the, the euro uh, is, uh, is as much a political project as an economic project. The euro dollar cross rate, uh, the euro US dollar cross rate is, as I say, just trades in a range. If you want to know how the dollar is doing, ask yourself the dollar price of gold, because gold is not a central bank currency. Gold cannot be pulled out of thin air. It can be mined, but that's an expensive, time-consuming process. And mining is kind of predictable. Total mining output uh, per year is about 1.6% of the total global uh, stock of gold in the world. So it's it can vary a little bit, but that's that's pretty uh, steady as a rate of increase. And so, um, so you know what the gold supply is going to be. And if you see the dollar getting stronger, that means the dollar price of gold is going down. If the, and if you see the dollar price of gold going up, it means the dollar is getting weaker. Well, right now, uh, interest rates are going up, the dollar is getting stronger, and the dollar price of gold is going down. There's every reason to expect that will reverse sooner than later. And I make the point, this is not uh, this is not the first time we've seen interest rates spike. If you go back over the last 10 years, um, the yield of maturity on the 10-year treasury note has spiked on a number of occasions, but notably, um, it hit um, about 3.5%, came down, then there was another spike around two and a half percent came down again. A third spike around 2% came down again. Uh, and right now it's spiked up to 1.6%. Notice the pattern. A technician would first of all point out that this is a pattern which, which, which is called a, a lower, lower highs and lower lows. In other words, there are highs and lows, there is volatility, but each high is a little bit lower than the one before. And the trend is down and each low drops lower than the one before, which means you're getting closer to zero. So we have a spike right now, and the price of gold has gone down, but one of two things is going to happen. Either that's going to turn around. Uh, there is no inflation. The, the, um, the, the interest rates are going up based on inflation expectations. And I want to emphasize the word expectations. We have this $1.9 trillion spending bill They're going to, in the US. They're going to hand out $1,400 checks to everyone pretty much. Um, the expectation is people are gonna run out and spend the money and uh, that's gonna boost GDP and exceed available capacity and we're gonna get inflation so interest rates are going up. Uh, no, none, none of that's gonna happen. We, we are gonna hand out the checks, but the evidence is very good that people don't spend the money, they actually save it. And I'll here I'll refer you to um, uh, this chart, which is the uh, savings rate. Um, now, if you notice, this, this goes back uh, 20 years. The U.S. savings rate runs between 5 and 8%. It, it's very steady. Again, some wiggles, some volatility uh, picked up a little bit in uh, 2013, but it kind of runs uh, pretty consistently between 5 and 8%. Look at what happened at the start of the pandemic. Uh, it went up to almost 20%. i sorry, actually, uh, over, uh, I think that's over uh, close to 30%. Uh, and uh, so it, it, it spiked to 30%. It came back down, but it didn't come back down to the range. It came back down to around um, uh, 13 or 14%. And in the most recent reading, it spiked up again closer to 15%. These are sky high interest rates. These are like Chinese interest rates in the United States, um, which means that you can hand out money, but people aren't spending it. They're putting it in the bank or they're uh, paying down debt, which economically is the same thing, they're deleveraging their balance sheet. So again, pushing money out the door doesn't do any good if people don't spend it. And right now they're not. Uh, people are, um, you know, if you've lost your job, you're not taking your friends out to dinner. You're putting the money in the bank or paying off your credit card. Even if you haven't lost your job, you might be concerned that you will lose your job or your company will fail next month. And so you're putting it in the bank. It's what economists call precautionary savings or you know, saving for a rainy day. So here you see um, the, uh, the savings, uh, savings rate uh, going up. That's what stands in the way of government spending really stimulating the economy. And then coming back to um, what we showed uh, earlier, um, uh, 
the, 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 the inflationary expectations are going to be disappointed because people are not using the money to spend and stretch the capacity of the economy, they're saving it. So when that data comes through, uh, probably by mid year, uh, the interest rates are gonna come back down, the price of gold is gonna soar, and we're gonna be back into that upward trend we described. Now, what if I'm wrong? I mean, I don't, I don't think I am wrong, or I wouldn't have explained it that way. But what if I'm wrong and the inflation actually shows up? Guess what? Gold's gonna go up. In other words, gold will go up if interest rates come back down, or if we get actual inflation, gold is going to go up because it always does in inflation. Uh, right now, we have the, the kind of the worst of all possible worlds. We have higher interest rates uh, in anticipation of inflation, but we have no actual inflation. So there's, there's no actual inflation there to get the price of gold going, but the uh, higher interest rates are a headwind because it makes the dollar stronger. So one of two things is going to happen. Either those rates are going to come right back down, which I expect, um, or the inflation is going to show up, uh, which I don't expect, but I, I can't roll it out. But either one of those is going to get gold uh, going back up again. And let me just uh, uh, flip ahead, uh, Sean. Here's a um, here's just a, a very simple illustration of where the price of gold is going. Now, this is in uh, what I call monetary reset. This is what would happen if you had a gold standard. I'm not saying we will have a gold standard. There's not a central bank in the world that wants a gold standard. But if you thought about it, if you wanted to have a gold standard or you uh, wanted to just use gold as a metric in, in terms of monetary policy, here's what you'd have to take into account. So let's just start with the money supply. Um, M1 money supply, and I use the large economies, US, China, Japan, the Eurozone, and, uh, and the UK. And, and you can include Australia, uh, Canada, um, uh, New Zealand. It, the numbers don't change that much. They don't change significantly. Uh, but that's about $32.3 trillion. How much gold is there? Well, there's official gold, about 34,000 metric tons. Uh, and people say, uh, well, there's not enough gold to support the, the world money supply. Maybe there was once upon a time, but uh, you know, commerce and payments and leverage and debt and everything has expanded so much, we don't have enough gold. And the answer to that is nonsense. There's always enough gold. It's just a question of price. So let's just do the math. So with 32.3 trillion of money supply, what if you wanted a gold standard with 40% backing? And that, that's high historically. You know, the Austrians bang the table and say it has to be 100% or it's fractional reserve banking. That's fine. But the reality is gold standards have succeeded with between 20 and 40% backing. So let's just take the high end of that range, 40% backing. Well, that means you need $12.9 trillion worth of gold. That's 40% of 32.3 trillion. So I said we have 34,000 metric tons. Let's just take $2,000 per ounce. I know gold's about 1,700, but just use $2,000 per ounce for a round number. Um, gold has been there recently. 34,000 tons times $2,000 per ounce is $2.2 trillion. Well, I said we needed $12.9 trillion. Well, it looks like we don't have enough gold. But what happens if we change the price, come down to the second row um, to $12,000 per ounce? Well, voila, you know, 34,000 metric tons at $12,000 per ounce, it's $13.2 trillion. That's more than enough to back global M1 at a rate of 40%. So the point is there's always enough gold. It's just a question of price. But if you want a gold standard or if you want to use gold as a, as a metric, the price has got to be $12,000 per ounce. If it's not, if it's any less than that, you've created a, a deflationary system. You're repeating the blunder of Winston Churchill in 1925. So my point is, it's not that central banks are going to opt for a gold standard. It is the case that this is the direction gold is going, and it's going to get there sooner than later uh, because uh, of so much money printing and ultimately a loss of confidence um, in the dollar itself. And just one uh, last slide. Here um, is the history of, uh, of uh, bull markets. And I don't have any bull markets before 1971. Well, there's a reason for that, which is before 1971, Gold was money. It wasn't a question of, you know, what I mean, there was a fixed, there's a gold standard, there was a fixed price for gold, but gold was actually a form of money. It was treated as such by the IMF and others. It was only in 1971 when Richard Nixon stopped the convertibility of dollars for official gold that uh, the gold market went its own way. So we've had, uh, we're now in the third great bull market. The, the first bull market you see goes from 1971 to 1980. And that was a 2,100% gain. 
Then we had a long bear market, just kind of flat to down, grinded down for almost 20 years. Uh, and then in 1999, the second bull market takes off. Gold was about $250 an ounce at the time. Uh, and that ran until August 2011, uh, when gold hit $1,900 per ounce. And that gain was 670%. We're now in the third great bull market of history. Uh, it started, I can tell you the exact date, December 16th, 2015. Gold came in at $1,050 an ounce. Uh, as I mentioned today, it's around $1,700 an ounce. It was a little bit higher uh, just a few months ago. Uh, that's a gain of about 65%. So here's the point. Using, uh, here's a little bit of uh, a technical analysis and history. Uh, there's no guarantee, of course, but if you just took a simple average of the last two bull markets. So average the 2,100% and the 670% and uh, average the time period. So one was uh, uh, 10 years and the other one, I'm uh, sorry, one was nine years uh, and the other bull market was 12 years. So take a, a you know, 10 and a half year average uh, with the average gain of about 1,400%. That would put gold at $15,000 an ounce uh, by March, 2026. Uh, so that's just, and that's just an average. It could be higher sooner. Uh, there's no ruling that out, but I'm just saying, and I'm not picking the higher of the two, I'm not coming up with crazy numbers. Uh, that's just a simple average of the last two bull markets. So whether it's uh, an applied gold standard where you have to get to $12,000 an ounce to avoid deflation or a simple bull market, that's the average of the prior two, uh, which comes out to $15,000 an ounce, Gold is going much, much higher. Now, people say, oh, wait a second, Jim, you know, $15,000, that seems like a crazy price. It's, all, it's not even $2,000 an ounce right now. How are you going to get there? Um, I just showed you mathematically and historically why that's coming. Uh, but there's, a, there's another piece of math I think people need to bear in mind. Um, if gold, let's just take $2,000 an ounce as a baseline. For gold to go from $2,000 an ounce to $3,000 an ounce, that's a 50% increase. That's a big gain. Um, but as you get to progressively higher levels, each $1,000 increment is a smaller and smaller percentage of the base because you're starting from a higher level. So in other words, if gold is at $14,000 an ounce and you're going to $15,000 an ounce, that's only a 7% gain. That's like one week's volatility. Uh, the point being, it's still $1,000. If you own an ounce of gold, you made $1,000, it's real money, but it gets easier to take those $1,000 leaps as you get to higher levels because each leap is a smaller percentage of the new base. And so that's why markets like, uh, you know, real bull markets can go a little bit hyperbolic and they do at the end. So yeah, you've got a, you've got a, a slow grind maybe from 2000 to 3000 to 4000, but at that point, the incremental $1,000 gains go from you know, 20% to, to, to to 14%, to 10%, to 7%. They just get easier as you go along. So, uh, Sean, that's uh, hopefully answers your question, but I think a, a little history and uh, some fairly simple math, you know, we can use calculus when we have to, but you don't really need it for something like this, uh, shows that the uh, uh, the gold bull market is intact. Uh, interest rates are going to turn around or inflation is going to show up. Either one uh, is extremely bullish for gold. Yeah, absolutely. So what do you think of the gold price right now, sitting at around 1700 an ounce? I mean, a gold miners, as far as their margins go, would it be true to say that their margin is around $900 an ounce, give or take $50, somewhere around there? So That's right. That's right, because um, you have to understand, I mean, gold is not something that turns on a dime, no, no pun intended. But uh, uh, if you start a gold mine, I'm, I'm an investor in some gold mines and I've visited them and all over the world, um, it can take five to seven years uh, in between getting the land, getting the rights, getting the permits, environmental regulations, you know, et cetera, capital costs, a lot goes into it, or even if you're repurposing an existing mine, uh, it's, it's a very expensive process and it takes time. So the gold mines that are coming on stream today or that were already producing or still producing, they were they had to be feasible at, at gold prices of $1,000 or $1,100 an ounce. Uh, they weren't, uh, no one was expecting necessarily $1,600 gold or, or $2,000 gold, you had to convince investors that you could be profitable at, let's just say $1,000 an ounce. 
and they were. Uh, costs have not gone up that much. We have not had a lot of inflation. Uh, we have capital costs are, um, have actually come down. Um, the short term rates are zero. Long term rates are about one and a half percent. Uh, you know, labor costs have not not gone up, et cetera. So uh, those feasibility studies at thousand dollars an ounce still work, except the price is seventeen hundred dollars. So margins are greater. And I think, as most investors know, uh, gold mining of uh, buying a gold mine, a, go a gold mining stock is a leverage bet on gold. Uh, if gold goes up and you own gold, you make money. But if you own a gold mining share, you make even more money because just the economics of a corporation, because you've got fixed costs and, and floating costs uh, or, or variable costs rather. So um, your fixed costs don't go up. The variable costs go up a little bit, but not that much, which means as the price of gold goes up, that extra uh, gain, that extra margin drops straight to the bottom line. And the stock market will give you a multiple of that uh, in terms of a stock market valuation. So buying a gold mining share is a leverage bet on gold. And if gold goes up the way I expect for the reasons I just explained, uh, gold mining shares will do even better. I mean, if gold uh, doubles uh, or triples, you should expect gold mining shares to go up by a factor of 10 or 20. Yeah, absolutely. There's one thing that I've noticed. Let, let, let me know if you think this is true, but I tend to look at gold equities and I see them move about a month or two before actually gold moves. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't know if the uh, the, the miners are, are smarter than the people that own the gold bullion. I'm not sure. What, what is the reason for that happening? Um, and the other part of the question would be, there's been a big increase in physical demand for gold. So there's obviously two types of demand. There's investor demand and there's uh, you know demand for the physical. Uh, in China, there's been a huge increase just this quarter in in real physical gold. And uh, I think in India, same sort of thing. But so could you address those two questions? Uh, you know, do gold miners tend to lead gold? Um, and are they a good way of looking at um, where gold's likely to go. And then do you see a, a big increase for the physical demand? I think last year was mainly investor demand, right? With the ETFs right. and things like that. Um, right. what, what, what are your views on that? Yeah, uh, first of all, gold, uh, all, all markets tried to lead the, um, the reality of the real estate of the economy to some extent. So people say stock markets generally um, tell you where the economy is gonna be in six months, they have a six month kind of forward horizon. Uh, bonds do better than gold. I think bond market investors look further ahead. Um, sorry, uh, bonds do better than stocks, I meant to say. Uh, but gold is the most forward leaning. People, people see movements in gold and they go, what the heck's going on? But then a year later, you know, something will happen. It's like, oh yeah, that, that made sense. So I think gold is one of the, I use it in my predictive analytic models. And I think gold is one of the best forward indicators um, that you can find. It has daily volatility. I don't get too hung up on the day-to-day -day price. I watch it, of course, but um, I try to watch the trends. And as I said, the trend right now is up, even though in the short term, my gold's backed off a little bit. Uh, but uh, yeah, it's just a kind of combination of two. If stocks look forward and gold leans forward, then it makes sense that gold mining stocks would be uh, forward leaning. The, the market, uh, you know, the big guys, you know, the Barracks and the Newmonts, um, and they're such large corporations. Uh, um, they've almost given up on the exploration business. They just buy junior miners. I mean, the, the way uh, the way Barrick expands output and um, increases its earnings per share, it's just a big corporation. So buying junior miners with proven capacity, um, if you can do it in a way that's not uh, dilutive, that's accretive to your earnings, you can make more money and get a higher stock price. But that's what they do. So the, the real action in uh, gold mining shares is in, junior miners. Now you have to be careful. I, I tell people all the time, um, you know, feasibility study is a feasibility study. Geology is geology. Capital costs are capital costs. Those things don't vary very much. Uh, the thing that sets one gold mining stock uh, apart from the others is management, because that's not generic. Uh, some of these companies have excellent management of CEOs who have done it before. This is their latest venture. Some of them are frauds. So uh, how do you sort, sort out between the uh, uh, you know, the, the, the well-managed ones and the frauds. Well, you know, do your homework, do your due diligence, of course, and obviously have a good advisor on that. But that's that's the thing to look for, because as I say, the uh, the rest of it is kind of, uh, you know, if you have a good feasibility study and, and, and you've got capital, you'll find some gold, but does, does management know what they're doing? Do they know how to keep costs under control? Do they know how to get access to the mills? Um, those are all the key things that, that determine the success. 
but um, but the but the thing is, there are multiple ways to make money on gold mining shares. One is you just find the gold, the price of gold goes up, and you make some money. That's that's pretty straightforward. But the other way is uh, if your company gets taken over, you know, at some point after some success, along comes uh, you know along comes Barrick or uh, I am Gold or you know one of the giants and and buys you up at a premium, and so you can make even more money. So it's an attractive area, but as I say you have to be careful because. Um, there are, you know, the good guys and bad guys in the space and you have to stick with the good guys. Yeah, a- absolutely. Uh, I saw a Newmont mining offering almost a 4% yield. That's not too bad mm-hmm. either. Uh, but, uh, yeah, certainly I, I think that, uh, very true and very interesting. So what I'd like you to do right now, if you don't mind, uh, Jim is sort of talk a little bit about this government spending and, you know, the fact that, the Federal Reserve can't really afford for rates to go up. Are they going to intervene and try and keep rates lower? I mean, just the interest payment on the debt is really going to be a big problem if rates do go up. They've got a huge amount of tools that they can use uh, at their disposal. I mean, the Bank of Japan is now the largest owner of equities. Uh, I don't know whether the Federal Reserve can own equities. They probably need congressional approval for that, I would assume. But they're certainly investing in ETFs um, and, and, and those types of things. So if you wouldn't mind talking a little bit about the amount of money that they're printing, the fact that they've got to be able to keep rates low, but also they've got a huge amount of tools to keep this going. Uh, well, they sort of have to. Yeah, they have some tools. The question is, do the tools work, or do the tools work the way they think they should? And that—that's really the uh, uh, the question. So let me uh, let me go back to the uh, slides. Bear with me a second. I'll uh, we'll break away from gold, and I'll go to some slides that uh, address this point uh, correctly or directly, rather. So um, so here's the uh, so here, here's the one we showed before, which is savings are sky high. Now let's look at. Uh, Let's look at the national debt. Again, this is the United States, but it's not that different in Europe. And uh, Australia is actually in better shape. Australia is not, uh, um, not as bad off. But, but the U.S. dollar is the leading reserve currency and uh, tends to lead the world in these things. So let's let's focus on the U.S. So, um, so here's the U.S. debt to GDP ratio. It's just what's the national debt divided by GDP. It's that simple, all in, uh, in nominal terms. And you see it uh, going back to uh, 1980 when it was at a, uh, at the time about a 40 year low of 30%. 30% is very comfortable, very sustainable. No one gets uh, too, uh, too concerned when, when you're at 30%. And, and as I say, you'll do fine. Um, 60%, six zero is the level at which uh, it, be, it starts to become problematic. By the way, this is the standard in the Maastricht Treaty for the Euro. This is where Angela Merkel, uh, you know, breaks out in highs when she sees her members uh, or the members of the euro going above 60 percent. Germany has done a good job of staying at that level. Well, you see the United States broke through that level around uh, 1990. Uh, but by 2000, um, when George H.W. Bush came in, we, we got a little bit below that. So I'll give credit to uh, Bill Clinton for a lot of that accomplishment. Then it went up again, but not a lot. But look at what happens in uh, 2008. Uh, when Obama comes in, uh, it just skyrockets. And that red line is the 90% debt to GDP ratio. And I'll come back to what that means. Uh, so then it goes up again, uh, it levels off later in the Obama administration, uh, it goes up a little bit with Trump. Uh, so that's around 160%. And then of course you see the pandemic at the end, it shoots up to around the uh, 130% level, which is, uh, well, again, I'll talk about the uh, significance of that. So, um, so first of all, let's just talk about what the 90% threshold means. And we crossed that in, uh, in 2010. Um, this is based on the research of Carmen Reinhardt and Ken Rogoff. Uh, Carmen uh, was a Harvard professor. She's now the chief economist of the World Bank. Uh, Ken Rogoff is a professor of economics at Harvard. Uh, and they've done tons of studies on this. Uh, of course, they had that book this time. It's different. It's in the book. But they've, they've written quite a few papers, uh, both... Uh, together with other collaborators individually. They've looked at debt to GDP ratios. Uh, they've, they've, for hundreds of years, uh, they've done it for shorter periods. They've looked at developed economies only, developing economies only, all economies, et cetera. And every way they sliced it um, along those lines, they discovered a common denominator, which is when, when your debt to GDP ratio crosses 90%, the Keynesian multiplier goes below one. 
meaning you're, you start out with reduced diminishing returns, uh, and then finally you get, in effect, negative, uh, uh, more, negative marginal returns. So again, as I said, you borrow a dollar, spend a dollar, and you don't even get a dollar back in terms of GDP. In fact, the high debt to GDP ratio becomes a headwind to growth because again, as I said, people look at it and they say, well, I, you know, I'm not an economist, I'm not the secretary of treasury, but uh, I, I know this is gonna end badly either in the form of, 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 I mean, only one of three things can happen at these levels. You cannot borrow your, borrow your way out. As I said, when you borrow the dollar, spend the dollar, you get less than dollar growth, you're increasing the ratio. It's more of a headwind to growth. So you cannot borrow your way out of it. You can grow your way out of it uh, with by increasing the denominator with real growth, but there's no evidence that that's happening. In fact, I could go through a long list of Biden administration proposals from shutting down the Keystone Pipeline, eliminating uh, oil and natural gas leases on federal lands, uh, proposal to increase the minimum wage to $15 an hour, uh, further debt, uh, which makes this chart worse, um, and uh, more regulation, higher income taxes, a long list of things that are going to basically stifle growth. So it'd be nice to think you could grow your way out of it, but we can't. You can't borrow your way out of it. There are only three ways out. One is default. Uh, the other one is inflation. And the third one is higher taxes. Uh, well, let's take higher taxes off the table because if your problem is you're not growing, higher taxes are gonna hurt growth even more. So that's not a way out. There's no reason for the U.S. to default. We um, we can print the money. Uh, may not be pretty, but we can do it. And so can uh, Australia or or uh, uh, any other country. If, if you're borrowing in your own currency, you can print the money. Now, for example, Argentina's problem is they print pesos, but they borrow dollars. Well, that doesn't work if, because you can't print. They can't print the dollars. They have to go borrow them from, from somewhere or get them from the IMF. But if you're borrowing in your in a currency that you print, you can print the money. So we're not going to default. Uh, raising taxes is not a solution. There are too many hedgewinds to growth. So what's the only way out? It's inflation. It has to happen. Uh, now, central banks don't know how to get inflation. That's the problem. They've been trying for 12 years, but they've failed completely. Uh, we kind of explained it in the other charts. All you really have to do is devalue the dollar against gold. And there's your inflation. Take gold to $5,000 an ounce, let's say. Um, and the, the purpose of doing that is not to enrich gold investors. It will, but that's not the reason. The reason you want gold at $5,000 an ounce or higher is because it makes the price of everything else go up. You know, the world of $5,000 gold is the world of, you know, $400 oil and $10 a gallon at, at, the, at the gas pump, uh, $100 silver, $20 copper. It makes everything else go up. And that's what um, I talk about this in the conclusion of my book, The New Great Depression. And that's what Franklin Delano Roosevelt did in 1933. Uh, and Richard Nixon did in 1971. Roosevelt did it intentionally to break the back of deflation in the Great Depression. Nixon did it by accident because he, he didn't really know what he was doing and then got distracted with Watergate and ended up resigning. Uh, and it took some years to, to play out. But in both cases, um, the, uh, the dollar was uh, devalued against gold and the inflation was right behind. So that's why gold's gonna go up. Uh, that's the way out of this mess that, I'm, that, that you're seeing here in the data, uh, but, uh, but not yet. It's gonna take a while. We'll probably have deflation before we get to the kind of inflation I'm talking about. Now here, let's talk about the Fed for a second. I just talked about uh, deficit spending. Here's the money supply. So again, um, it rises steadily through QE1, QE2, QE3 between 2008 and 2014. Um, and then it, it, uh, you know, it continues upwards from there. But of course, look at what happens in the pandemic. It goes almost vertical in, in a couple of different stages. And uh, uh, M1 money supply is now uh, close to $7 trillion. It's actually higher. Um, I, I update these charts, but it's a little bit actually higher today than is shown here. So people go, well, there's your inflation right there. Look at that. The Fed printed, you know, four trillion dollars or three and a half trillion dollars of money. We're going to get the inflation. And the answer is no. Money printing does not cause inflation. Most people think it does. That's what Milton Friedman said. That's what everyone was taught. That's incorrect. Inflation is caused by velocity, which is the turnover of money. So think of money as your, your dry fuel, as your dry wood, uh, but it won't turn itself on fire. You need a match or lightning or a spark or something. And that spark is velocity. 
Um, and just to kind of explain that very quickly, you know, if I go out for dinner and I tip the waiter and the waiter takes a taxi home and tips the taxi driver and the taxi driver puts gas in her taxi, um, my dollar has velocity of three, one dollar supported, you know, the waiter's tip, the taxi tip and the gasoline. So the velocity was three. But if I stay home and watch TV, my money has velocity of zero because I didn't spend it. And I remind people that seven trillion dollars times zero is zero. If you don't have velocity, you don't have an economy. So let's have a look at velocity. It's crashing. And this is how you can understand monetary policy. My supply is soaring, but velocity is crashing. Has been crashing since 2008, by the way. This is, um, you have to pick your money supply. This is M1, but um, it, it's uh, the, the crash is even longer using M0 and other measures of money supply. Look at what happened in 2020. That's an Acapulco cliff dive. That uh, in this chart, uh, velocity has crashed from uh, almost 11, called 10 and a half, to, um, to almost three which means in 2008, a dollar produced over $10 of goods and services. Today, the same dollar barely produces $3 of goods and services and velocity continues to crash. And this is not something the Fed can control. This is a psychological behavioral phenomena only made worse by the pandemic. So fiscal policy doesn't work because the debt to GDP ratio is too high. Monetary policy doesn't work because velocity is collapsing. So kind of getting back to your question, Sean, yeah, there are these big spending bills. Uh, the Fed's printing money, the Congress is handing it out practically in street corners, but none of it will work because, uh, uh, because of these behavioral uh, adaptations, behavioral changes that are not going away soon. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, now, Jim, your views on a lot of people are asking this in the chat right now, uh, the US dollar becoming digital, like some sort of digital currency uh, regarding the US dollar. Uh, how is that going to impact things going forward? And a lot of people are asking, will the US lose their uh, world reserve currency status? Right. Well, I don't know how to break it to people, but the dollar has been digital since 1980. That was the last time that the US Treasury issued a paper. Uh, used to, at least when you bought a Treasury bond, you, know, you got a nice piece of paper with seals on it. That hasn't been true for 41 years. So the dollar is digital. You can have a couple of dollars in your pocket in Philadelphia, we call it walking around money, but that's a small slice of the money supply payments. You know, um, you know, when people get paid, you get a wire transfer or direct deposit from your employer. When you go shopping, use a credit card or a debit card or uh, an iPhone, Apple Pay, whatever. Um, uh, certainly commercial transactions are all funded with digital wire transfers and all that message traffic is encrypted. So the dollar is already a, a digital cryptocurrency. Uh, but uh, I, I take the point that what people are really interested in are so-called cryptocurrencies, things like Bitcoin, but more, more uh, to the point, they're interested in um, uh, what, what we're now called uh, CBDCs. Um, there used to be a disco in, uh, or a, a joint in New York called the uh, C CBGBs, but this, these are CBDCs, which are central bank digital currencies. That's what it stands for. Um, uh, People's Bank of China has a pilot project. They're moving forward with it. Uh, Madame Lagarde, who's the head of the uh, European Central Bank has said they're looking into it. The Fed uh, hasn't embraced it so much, but they're, pardon me, they're doing some research on it. So um, yeah, but here's the thing about central bank digital currencies. First of all, and they may be on the way, but it's still the same currency, meaning they may use the blockchain. By the way, blockchain technology has been around since the 80s, 1980s, nothing new about that. And it's useful. It's good for a lot of things. But um, th they may use the blockchain, but it's the same euro, the same dollar, the same Australian dollar. It's not a new currency. It's the old currency with a new way of transferring it or moving it through the payment system. So that may come to pass, but it's not a new currency. And number, number one, number two, these currencies are for the most part already digital and with encrypted message traffic. So it's not that big a change, but it does, it does do a couple of things that are really important. Number one, um, I always say, if you're gonna slaughter sheep, first you have to herd them into a pen and get them down a chute and then slaughter them. It's the same thing with savers. If you wanna slaughter savers, you have to get them into a digital pen and slaughter them with negative interest rates. Now, right now, um, a lot of uh, economists and others are saying we should have negative interest rates because uh, you know, if I'm taking your money away, that'll make you go spend it. It actually 
turns out the opposite is true. If you take my money away, people save more because they have lifetime goals. But leave aside the fact that the economists are wrong, they're usually wrong, so, so we're used to that. But if you're gonna do it, if you say, um, okay, we're gonna have negative interest rates, I get, well, that's fine. I'll just walk down to the bank, say, give me all my money in cash, you know, put it in a vault or a safe place uh, so, somewhere. Come back a year later, my money's still there. Whereas if you have the money in the bank, you know, if you had 100,000 in the bank, you come back a year later, you're only gonna have 99,000 because they took out 1% negative interest rate. So everyone would just get cash, put it in a safe place and not be subject to, inter to negative interest rates. Well, the central bankers know this. So they're like, well, we gotta get rid of cash uh, because as long as cash is an option, you can't really impose negative interest rates. So let's get rid of cash. Well, the way to do that is to have a central bank digital currency and force everybody into it the same way you force the cattle into the pen before you slaughter them. Um, and so that's one motivation for it. So you got to keep an eye out for that. By the way, the alternative for that, the solution for that, if you can't get cash, because governments are eliminating cash, get gold. Uh, one of the things I like about physical gold, we, we, uh, that was one of your earlier questions, Sean. Physical gold is not digital. You can't hack it. You can't freeze it. You can't uh, put negative interest rate. All the things you might want to do to cash, you can't do to gold, as long as you're not in a bank. You put it in a bank, you might confiscate it. But... Um, uh, so that's that's a solution there. Now, let's just go beyond that. The People's Bank of China is doing this. Why are they doing it? Well, it has some of the same benefits we talked about, but the a digital currency represents the completion of the totalitarian surveillance state. Because you're already pretty much under surveillance. I mean, London has the most closed circuit TV cameras of any city in the world. Show me a place that doesn't have a, a camera. People's homes are, have cameras. Um, I once I once accidentally bought an Alexa. I, I say accidentally. I was buying something on Amazon, some electronic thing, and they had so they had some promo like do this, click here and get an Alexa. And I clicked by accident, so I got the Alexa, which I didn't want. But I took it out in the driveway and I keep a sledgehammer and I destroyed it with a sledgehammer because that was the only way I felt safe. Um, but people don't understand. Even when you turn them off, they're still listening to you. And all the Alexas and Siri's and uh, there's another one, Google uh, Assistant, I don't even know. Um, in a neighborhood, the, those machines talk to each other about you. I mean, this, this is all documented. I'm not making it up. And they can decide collectively based on algorithms that if there's bad behavior, they'll call the police on you. So there's your, there's your digital assistant. You know, uh, be careful about those. But the point is, uh, digital currency is just one more way to keep track of people. But I did work for this years ago with the CIA where, you know, the terrorists were getting rid of their cell phones and we said, okay, can we track them with credit cards? And, you know, the, the answer is probably can. So, uh, but now um, we'll get rid of cash and make all payments digital, which means the government will know where you are, what you're spending your money on, what you're doing. They'll know that you go place to place and combine that with surveillance cameras, digital facial recognition software, easy pass, you know, we call it easy pass, the, the, you know, using paying tolls basically digitally, et cetera. Um, they've got you covered every inch of the way. And China is, is the furthest along in that in terms of, you know, complete control of the population. So central bank digital currencies have two hidden agendas. One is negative interest rates. Um, the other is um, surveillance state. Uh, and I would watch out for them for that reason. And, and gold is a good way, a uh, good way around it. Wow. Okay. Very interesting. Yes. Yeah, certainly about control. No doubt about that. Uh, also, a lot of my members are asking about silver. Uh, this is something that, um, you know, I mean, right now trading at hundred year lows compared to equities. Uh, it seems as if uh, it's being, I mean, th there's been a short squeeze on it recently with silver, but I think silver is far too big to have, uh, someone short squeeze it for a long, t long period of time. I think they would have been better off maybe shorting, um, short squeezing some sort of silver miner, perhaps with, uh, with, with, with uh, lower liquidity. But whatever the case is, silver doesn't seem to have moved up dramatically. And uh, is there any reason why silver is still relatively low compared to gold um, and what we're facing right now with uh, money printing and whatnot? Right. Well, I always say to the uh, to the what we call the Robin Hood bros, you know, the the, uh, the millennials taking their government checks and uh, using leverage and buying options on that on, on this Robin Hood app. Um, you can't run a short squeeze if nobody's short. So who says anybody's short silver? I mean, people are getting long silver. Uh, it, it's in it's in kind of short supply. Uh, 
but I, I'm not sure that there, there's a huge paper short community in silver to begin with, other than the you know, futures traders who they just kind of roll roll it over from uh, from uh, contract to contract. Um, but first of all, I noticed that when gold was going down a lot recently, which it has, uh, down about um, uh, you know about fifteen percent, uh, you know, in, in recent months, yeah. silver didn't go down that much. It went down. It didn't. It went up a little. Um, and then it came back a lot, but it hasn't gone down a lot. So silver has actually held up fairly well in, in a patch where uh, gold was getting uh, bashed a little bit, number one. So that's interesting. Um, silver is a little harder to analyze than gold because gold isn't good for anything. It, it's the best form of money. Gold is money. And so if you're interested in money and finance, keep an eye on gold. But it's not good for anything else. People go jewelry industry. Well, jewelry is just wearable wealth. You know, an Indian bride just she's got a dowry around her neck, but it's still they think of it as a form of wealth. They don't think of it as you know decorative jewelry. So I, I count jewelry as bullion, even though it's in a slightly different form. But other than that, it's got a few. Uh, I mean, I've been in refineries that, that talk about five five nines gold. It's only good for you know super super thin wires because for certain electronic applications they use it to coat a space helmet that's about it uh, but silver does have a lot of industrial uses in uh, um, in automobiles and um, you know a, a lot of other uh, a lot of other applications and so when you're analyzing silver you not only have to think about the precious metals aspect but the industrial aspects so you could have a situation where the economy is weak that would tend to take the price of silver down but um, they're printing money, which might push the price of silver up. So it's a little bit more of a mixed bag, a little bit harder to analyze. But look, silver is along for the ride. I mean, gold, if gold's going where I project and I expect it will, silver's going to silver's going to go to hundred dollars, not tomorrow, not not overnight. But, but let's put it differently. There's no way that's that gold's going to three thousand dollars an ounce without silver going to fifty dollars an ounce, and there's no way gold's going to five thousand without silver going to hundred. So silver is not going to be left in the dust. And I, I uh, by the way, I, I have uh, I have silver as well as gold. Uh, I buy one ounce American silver eagles. Um, if you have, if social disorder gets worse, and let's hope it doesn't, but if it does, and you start start to see infrastructure breakdowns, we saw a big one in Texas just uh, not even a month ago, where the entire state was frozen and the electric grid shut off and the windmills were frozen and natural gas uh, turbines didn't work. Um, guess what? There's no electricity. Well, good luck with your, with your Bitcoin and your, you know, your digital assets and payments in, in a world with no electricity. But, um, but silver, one ounce silver coins are still, uh, it's still money good. So you, in, a, in a more severe social breakdown, you might find that people don't want paper money and digital payments don't work because they're power grid problems, but they'll take, you know, four or five ounces of silver in exchange for food to feed your family. So it's good for that reason. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I would love to talk to you for many hours, to be honest. Uh, fantastic to be able to talk to someone of your ilk. And I really appreciate your time, but just to finish off, what I would love you to do is just give us your view on what's the best way to protect your wealth right now and uh, probably what are some of the things we need to look out for going forward as far as growing our wealth and, uh, you know, really making the best of this crisis and this wealth transfer that we find ourselves in? Sure. Um, and I, that's, that's a great question. And I, uh, I'd like to start with a, a real quick story. Uh, go back to 1922, the uh, German Weimar Republic hyperinflation. And that's, that's a well-known story. Everyone knows what happened. We don't need to recite that. But there was an individual at the time, and his name was Ugo Stinnes. And I talk about this at the end of chapter six, uh, sorry, the end of chapter five of my book, uh, The New Great Depression. Uh, Ugo Stinnes uh, saw the hyperinflation coming and he went out and before it hit and borrowed all the rice marks he could, that was the currency at the time. And he invested in hard assets. He bought coal, steel, shipping assets, railroads, et cetera. Then he just waited. And here comes the hyper, super hyperinflation. Well, he paid back all the debts. I'd like to say he paid pennies on the dollar, but it was a millionth of a penny on the dollar. They, they were sweeping the currency down the sewers, but he went through the exercise of paying back his debt with this worthless currency, and he kept the assets. And he was the, became the richest man in Germany. And I don't speak German, but his, his nickname was the Inflationskönig, which means the Inflation King. So the point of the story, it's a true story, you can look up Ugo Sinus, 
the point of the story is even in the greatest hyperinflation in the history of developed economies in the history of the world, this guy became the richest man in Germany because he saw it coming and he did the right thing. So the point I make to investors is that you're not helpless. Uh, hard, we're, we're in hard times. Uh, they may get worse in some ways, but you don't have to curl up in the ball. There's always something you can do to go out and at a minimum preserve wealth and even better prosper and, and make some money. So let's get specific about that. The first thing, and I hate cliches, this is gonna sound like a cliche, but, but it's important to explain what it means, is you need to have diversification. Now that sounds obvious. Every economics teacher will say, you have to diversify your assets, but people don't really understand it. I've run into investors and they say, well, I'm highly diversified. I've got 30 separate stocks in 10 sectors. I've got semiconductors, consumer non-durables, utilities, you know, et cetera. And I go, no, you're not, you're not diversified. You may have 30 stocks, but you have one asset class. It's called stocks. And they go up together and down together and you're not protected at all. So by all means, have, have a slice in stocks. That's fine. But um, have, uh, I, I recommend a significant slug of cash. And people go, well, cash has no yield. And why would you have cash, et cetera? But cash, uh, first of all, if we have deflation, not inflation, cash could be your best performing asset because the real value of cash goes up in deflation. Your money is worth more, even though there's no yield uh, because it has more buying power. But more to the point, here's what's not well understood. Cash has has embedded optionality. If you're the person, right now visibility is poor. We don't know exactly what's gonna happen. I have a forecast, but uh, you know, you, you've gotta really constantly update it. But as, as visibility improves, and we can see who's gonna win the tug of war between deflation and inflation, if you're the person with cash, you can pivot. You know, maybe you wanna buy more gold because here comes the inflation, or maybe everything ends well and you wanna buy more equities, et cetera. Well, you can do that if you have cash. If you throw all your money in private equity, um, and you decide that's not such a good bet, uh, you know, good luck getting your money back from Henry Kravis. I mean, he's, he's a great private equity manager, but he's not going to give you your money back early. You're stuck. So it's, it's a good idea to keep some cash in reserve. Beyond that, um, you know, some alternatives, uh, you know, some room for private equity, room for venture capital. Um, uh, I, I highly recommend residential real estate in what I call go-to locations. Let me just explain that briefly. Right now we're seeing this in the United States, but I don't doubt you're seeing it in, in Victoria and Melbourne and, and elsewhere. Um, people are getting out of the cities. I mean, cities have always been a trade-off. On the one hand, there's noise and pollution, a certain amount of crime and high taxes and all that. But on the other hand, you have museums and cultures and great restaurants and, and there's a lot of buzz and people find it very attractive. And on balance, people have accepted the trade-off. They'll say like, I'll take the excitement of the city despite the inconveniences. And they've always been magnets for talent, um, you know, lawyers, bankers, uh, artists, uh, writers, um, other professionals, uh, actors, et cetera. Um, but now what's happened is we've got all the disadvantages, at least in the United States, um, you know, the, the dirt, the noise, the pollution, worse. Murder rate in New York has doubled, suicide rates have tripled, drug abuse is up, you know, et cetera. So we have, the disadvantages are worse, but the benefits are gone. The museums are closed, Broadway's closed, uh, you know, et cetera. So people are just getting out of the cities. Um, and so residential real estate in places like Los Angeles, New York, uh, San Francisco, Seattle, elsewhere, and I dare say Melbourne are actually collapsing. But you say, where are they going? In the United States, they're going to Miami, uh, Nashville, Tennessee, Austin, Texas, Boise, Idaho, Phoenix, Scottsdale, and some other kind of magnet cities. Um, and and so, uh, so basically residential real estate in the places that where people are going, Miami is red hot right now, Phoenix, red hot, Austin, same thing. So there are good opportunities there. Commercial real estate, forget it. Uh, it's nowhere near the bottom, probably wouldn't even look at it for maybe another year. Um, and then finally, uh, gold. I recommend 10% gold. Uh, you know, people, I talk about gold all the time and people always want to put words in your mouth and they go, well, Jim Rickards says sell everything and buy gold. I've never said that. I don't believe that. I, you know, it's not the end of the world. We'll get through it. We'll muddle through. Uh, but 10% gold, yeah, that's that's a good piece to have. It It's your inflation protection, obviously. Uh, it's also, a, if it's physical gold, it's a non-digital asset. If it's gold miners, it, it's it's a leverage bet, so you can make even more money. Um, but people don't understand that gold does very well in deflation. You know, in, in 1929 to 1933, the longest period of sustained deflation in US history, gold went up 
75% from $20 an ounce to $35 an ounce. There's a reason for it. That's going back to what I said earlier, governments get so desperate in deflation that they devalue the dollar and raise the dollar price of gold to get inflation. So, so gold ends up being the vehicle to break the back of deflation, which they have to do. So gold does well in just about every state of the world. Fantastic. Amazing advice. And I really appreciate you being here, Jim. And I hope to talk to you again sometime in the future. Uh, everyone here is very appreciative of your time. Thank you so much for being here, Jim. I really appreciate it. And all the best going forward, my friend. Thank you, Sean. Thank you.